Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Lansky, the West Coast editor of Time, and I'm so excited to be here with Ryan O'Connell, Emmy-nominated creator and star of the Netflix series Special, and Lena Waithe, Emmy-winning writer, producer, and actor whose projects include 20s, Boomerang, and last year's feature film Queen and Slim. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Um, I want to open by actually reading a thread that, Ryan, you posted on Twitter last weekend, which I think kind of gets to the heart of what we're doing here. Is it okay if I read it? Yeah, she's coming, with the, re- she's coming with the receipts. I love I know, it. I'm like, I'm, I'm I don't know if I saw these tweets yet. It was so much going on on Twitter. I'm just going to read this now, if that's, if that's cool, Ryan. Um, so you said on Twitter, being an LGBT person with a TV show, I am required by law to be on 40,000 panels about diversity and inclusion in Hollywood with other creators. Not uncommon for me to be on panels with the same people over and over, because there's really not that many of us. Here we are. Um, ah, these hilarious. discussions <laughs> typically veer into how we, as people with a modicum of power, can help enact change in this business, which is all fine and good, but I get frustrated because everyone knows there's only so much we can do. The real gatekeepers of this business are the network executives that Greenlight shows. Where's that panel, babe? I would love to see a bunch of network execs talk about their commitment to making different shows. They're the people who decide what we're going to see. How will they make sure that's going to be reflective of the world we live in rather than a bunch of shows starring Kevin James and hot white girls with bangs who are such hot messes. We should be talking to them, holding them accountable, rather than just talking to creators. Okay, bye. So, first of all, thank you for that. I, I yes. Think, uh, I, this, is, this is how we in the gay community say. Yes. I second that emotion. So, uh, it, brilliant, obviously. And I think to me, it begs the question, why is the emphasis always on creators instead of on the systems that create so much obstruction for creators? And more to the point, should we actually be here grilling the execs who have kept greenlighting the same kinds of stories for so long? Um, Ryan, maybe you can start and, and I, say no, Ryan, <laughs> I think and I'll follow up though. Yes, please, please. Yeah. On a superficial level, I think like having a panel of like creators slash celebs is more glamorous than like having a panel starring like Tom Buffalo Bill. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, who, like what? Like head VP for programming at Freeform. Like no one's begging to see that, honey. But like what I'm saying is like, so I understand the idea of getting a bunch of people together that are sort of in the same struggle in terms of wanting more diverse programming in Hollywood. But I do get frustrated just in the sense that there is this sort of like, well, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to, how are you going to wield your power? And I'm like, well, babe, like, I mean, you know, unless you're like Ryan Murphy, who truly has like abracadabra green light power, like, I feel like I, I hit a ceiling in terms of what I can do, especially with my television show. So it's like, you know, it's not like the creators aren't out there trying to get diverse stuff made. It's just that they're hearing a lot of no's and no's and no's while they're tweeting from their company Twitter, like, oh my God, like rainbow pride, like whatever. And they just like literally said no to like five gay TV shows in a row. So like, you know what I mean? So I'm just like accountability. Um, Yeah. So I, I do think though, I would love just the, the perspective of the people that are in charge of these program, like the programming of a t- the network, like Freeform or whatever, and have them all together and kind of, I would love to know why they haven't been green lighting those shows mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and how they're going to do better because they are the ones that are holding the keys. And I feel like people don't quite understand that. They think that if you have a TV show, then you can totally change the world and get this made and this made. And again, unless you're Ryan Murphy, that's just not reality. Mm-hmm. You know, how does that align with your experience? Um, No, I I totally agree. I mean, I am a prime example of having to wait for 20s to get to the air, you know, and when you look at 20s at face value, you kind of go, why hasn't this been done before? And, and and, And I think it's also important that these execs and these folks out there understand that, particularly when we're talking about the queer community, is there are many fractions to it. There just are. It's not you know, there's still so many things we haven't tackled, like asexuality, um, people being, you know, what what non-binary actually means, genderqueer. I'm a lesbian that is like, I consider myself masculine presenting or in the black gay community stud. There, there just aren't, there's, I think sometimes people think, oh, we got the L word, 
you know, you got, you, we had Queer as Folk, you had that one character on Six Feet Under. I think there's sort of this thing of like, okay, cool, you know, and I'll, I'll be 100. Like, I was working with Kid Fury, which I don't know if you guys are super familiar with. He has a show called The Read. He's super popular. He's this, you know, uh, gay black young man, but also deals with like mental stuff and has dealt with depression. And it was such, and, and he had a show in development at HBO. I raised my hand and said, let me help because a lot of these places don't know how to deal with talent. That's also not a straight white male or a, you know, quirky white girl. You know, it's like with, with, with queer people, with black people and brown people, people living with disabilities. There's a trauma that we have, especially when, our, when we're making art and we're going to create a process. There's also a level of sensitivity that needs to happen that also doesn't necessarily exist or is not there or not an understanding. Um, because it's true. People don't look like us that we're talking to that have to help us develop our shows, which means they literally give us notes on stories that only we know. So I'm grateful that at BET, because I have an Emmy, they know better than to say anything to me about notes or scripts or stories, because in essence, we're helping each other. Like, I'm like, you know, like TBS and Hulu didn't do it. And BET's like, well, we need it. We need you over here. I'm like, great. Well, I need carte blanche. Cool. So we both are kind of helping each other. But the thing about HBO developed that, you know, Kid Fury project for like almost a year and passed on it. Now, I got to give HBO credit. They have been secure. And they also have this show called um, I May Destroy You by Michaela, which is interesting because in the past, they wouldn't have Michaela's show on because they, well, we already have Insecure. We already have a brown skinned black girl who was going through adventures. Michaela could not be more different from Issa Rae. And that to me is revolutionary that they have these two shows about young black women. Obviously, one happens to be a Brit, but I love that they're trying to show you the diff. like these are two black women who are very different from each other and have very different experiences. And so to me, it's like how revolutionary would it have been if HBO said, yes, we'll have another show centered around a black protagonist, but he happens to be male and he happens to be queer and he also happens to be struggling with mental issues. Not mental issues, but like, you know, um, mental health, really. I don't even know it's an issue. It's like we all have mental health stuff. And and I've never really, I've, I personally have not quite seen Kid Fury, that character on TV. And so now we're, of course, taking it out and we're going to different places. And no shade, Amazon passed on, like a lot of these places are passing on it. It's true. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not trying to call nobody out about that. But the question becomes, why? If Dave can exist, no shade, no tea toward Dave. I watch that show like every other college white boy. But at the same time, it's like, in what world? Like, like it, it already the show already exists. It's called Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? But he's allowed to come and like do his thing and be surrounded by black characters. This is no shade toward Dave or Lil Dicky. I ain't got no problem with him. I like his show. You know, the fact that Rami is on, who I also love. But you can't, I, I, I think myself, Ryan, we can't sit back and look at these, 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 these shows and go, well, hmm, we still got some catching up to do. I love this show that happens to be on Showtime called A Work in Progress, which is also really interesting and, and showing just such a unique look at like sexuality and, and also too, I think one of the, the main character I believe is uh, struggling with OCD, I believe. Again, still white, you know what I'm saying? So the problem is, is like, I think they're taking uh, steps and even with like Pose, only Ryan Murphy could get that show greenlit. Pose is about black ball culture. No shade to Ryan Murphy, but at the end of the day, Lee Daniels couldn't get that show greenlit, you know? And, and so there's still a discrepancy here. And, and I agree, we do need to hold these executives' feet to the fire. But the truth is, if you had a string of execs on here, you know what they would say? Well, you need to be talking to my boss, not me, because I don't have power. I'm here to, like, keep you calm, give you notes, and, and, and make sure everybody here, you know, understands that I deserve the check that I get every month. So at the end of the day, like, I would, I would love for people to do, I'm telling you, it's an easy op-ed. All somebody got to do is literally take a photo of every person who is, the head, who is at the top of these places. And it's about five people. And the truth is, they're a group of white men. Now, somebody, and maybe one white woman in there, every once in a blue moon, some of which I do business with. You know what I'm saying? Like, I work with Jennifer Saki. I email with Peter Rice. I know Donna Langley. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm grateful to be in those circles. But the truth is, if you put a picture of them, these are people that actually determine what we see every day and what we digest. And I think the, the, if people really were paying attention, that is more powerful than the presidency. It's yeah. powerful. It's a powerful job. And they don't look like the world. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when we went out and pitched special in 2015, we had a lot of the, our pitches went really well. And I'm sure. Uh, 
And we had heard probably like from two or three of the networks that we pitched that like they were going to make an offer. And they it went up to the chain to someone probably named Ralph who lives in Marina Del Rey. Sure. And like Ralph was like, LOL, what's this anyways? <laughs> and then Ralph shut it down. Right. So it's like, we are a town ruled by Ralphs. And that like means yes. change, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so much, you know, so much of what, what uh, you're both talking about is, you know, this idea of platform and, and, you know, getting the space to tell more inclusive stories, which often is about having a kind of champion, someone with power who believes mm-hmm. in you. Yep. Amplify your voice as a creator with a distinctive identity or point of view who isn't part of the majority culture. Mm-hmm. Lena, who were some of the people who empowered you to tell your own stories? Well, for sure, David Nevins is a, is a, is a big one for me. Um, I also say Gary Levine. Um, and I mean, but also, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, there's been a lot of execs. Jennifer Saki, for sure, uh, who, who's over at Amazon. I mean, she's like, I think one of the biggest champions of mine, she, because I have an exclusive deal with them over at Amazon. So, and um, these are all white people, <laughs> you know, um, but, but David Nevins was, and, and David Nevins used to be the president of Showtime. Um, and, and, and now Gary Levine is the president of Showtime, but obviously uh, David Nevins is now the CEO of all Viacom. And because of that, because um, he was in the room when I pitched The Shy all those years ago. And, and it was a clear sign that it meant that because David Evans was in the room, that chances are it was like, it was looking good. And so he's known me since then. And um, and yeah, he, because he's now over at uh, Viacom, which is owned by BET and Showtime, which so many people are now going to be a little confused because 20s is going to air on Showtime. And B- The Shy was airing on BET, which is kind of a way of like saying like, look, this is all under the same umbrella. And he's doing a really interesting thing by exposing The Shy to people who may not have had Showtime and then exposing 20s to people who may not know where BET is on their, on their channel, on their dial. So, and so him, him using that power is really empowering me and my brand and it exposes my work to more people. And so, you know, I, that's why to me, it's like, I can't can't sit here and say like all these guys are bad all these people are bad because if Donna Langley gave me so much freedom and so much you know you know uh space to, to make Queen of Slim the way I saw fit and I think that's why the movie did what it did and Jennifer Saki raised her hand when Netflix didn't you know because we were out looking for looking for an overall and Netflix was like uh, we cool you know what I'm saying on you and 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 Jennifer Saki's like I'm I'm gonna like really invest in you in a real way and your company and I will forever be in her debt so what people have to understand is like the game is is real like you can't just like be be an island and, and just make dope stuff you need people to to say okay cool come on in let's work together and Ryan I'm sure you've had that experience too where you have these execs who just get it and who support you and sometimes they don't get it right away and then after once you become successful they get it even more and go, oh, okay, I get what you're doing. You know, the Emmy nominations help with that. And Emmy wins really help. Yeah, no, I, I've had the experience. I mean, Jim Parsons, it's he's the producer on Special. Nice. And I think him being like, oh, I want to do this, it really helped vouch because at the time I was like a story editor on MTV's Awkward, so I really had no pull whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I will say, I will say, and it, Warner Brothers, I mean, it took like 40 studios to get this short form show made, by the way. Of like, course, once, always. One studio for every minute. Um, and like, I will say Warner Brothers and Netflix have both been so incredible in terms of like, not f- with my vision. Like they've been right. really, really supportive and they've just, I mean, Netflix, like their notes are so thoughtful and like, right. There's not that many of them. They're more like overall thoughts. And so they've been really amazing. Warner Brothers has been the same way. So I have to say, like, I've been pretty hashtag blessed with with that part of special, with people just wanting to preserve the vision of the show and the voice. Um, so I've been really lucky because I know it can go another way. Yeah, that's true. For, for both of you, you know, as queer storytellers who have worked at multiple levels of this industry from writer's room to then creating your own shows, mm-hmm. what do you think is the biggest chain, thing that needs to change for entertainment to become more inclusive and equitable across the board? Is it really that question of, of gatekeepers? Is there, are there other things that sort of can happen throughout the process? Well, I mean, showrunners can obviously have a lot of responsibility where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, and also not to look at like diversity as checking a box. You know what I mean? I think that there's a lot of like, okay, like we need the, like there's this kind of sentiment in Hollywood where like, okay, we have to, for optics, you know, we need to make sure that we 
don't have a room, writer's room full of white people because we don't want someone to take a picture on Instagram and then have them get canceled. Um, I think we need to stop looking at things as the diversity box and the non-diversity box. Everything in an ideal world would just be one huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as a showrunner, it's your responsibility to search for the unexpected choice because you have a sea full of like white straight guys that are looking for jobs or whatever. It's like, it's your job to be like, okay, you know what? I'm going to dig a little deeper and go for the unexpected choice. Like, or, and it's also, it's also really, really important because it's so systemic and so many people are shut out. It's your job to also take a chance on somebody because it's like, you're like, as a disabled person, you're not going to find like the disabled Meryl Streep with 80 credits and like four, 40 million Oscars. <laughs> so like, for example, in, in my show, um, you know, we cast the writer's assistant who is on the spectrum and I wrote him apart because I think he's genius and has star power. And um, like, I remember initially people were a little skittish, like, oh, this is a first time actor. And I was like, babe, I was a first time actor. I never acted in my life. I went from being Same. like- Same. Same. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, and that's what you have to do. Cause again, you're not going to find Meryl, honey. You're not going to find like the, nope. the disabled, like swimming in awards. Like you have to take it. Also goes for the trans community as well too. Yeah. Give people grace. Give people grace. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because the, the pathways that you typically take to get in, they're shut out of. So you have, it is your job to take a chance on these people. And obviously everyone was super on board. I just remember, I just remember it was like an, an initial thought, a concern. And I was like, LOL, like, again, I was a first time actor, you can't even use that as an excuse. And they were like, Oh, yeah, that's fair. And he did a great audition, blah, blah. blah. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I think I think it's not just, you know, the, the Ralphs and the Todd's and whatever, and the Dave's it's it is, you know, as a job as, as a showrunner, it's, you know, will your job take a little longer looking for the unexpected choice? Yes, but it's that's your job. That's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You have to pay it forward. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of power does rest in showrunner hands. Um, but uh, but that being said, because I really, uh, and I, the question you ask often does get asked to us, you know, like, how do we fix this? And I'm going to be, and I've been to saying this, and I'm going to continue to say it and be bold. Here's the deal. For a long time, white people didn't want to let go of Jim Crow, right? That We lived in a segregated country. I, I, what I try to also, too, scare people is, like, my mom was born into a segregated America. My mom was born in 1953. Like, that's how close it is. So I use this example is to say, if, you, if they, people would have just said, well, you know what? Let's end segregation. Let's end it. It's ridiculous. No one would have done it because it benefited a group of people. They had better water fountains. They had better schools. They had cleaner pools. It had to be a law. It had to be against the law to say, to get to take the colored signs down, take the whites only signs down. We need to instill mandates in this industry. Otherwise we will not see change. This needs to be mandated. They gotta say like, you need to, like, like look at the population, and it's easy to do. If you look at our population, like black people make up 13% of the population. I'd love to know what, what, how much people living with disabilities, what, how much of the population they make up, the trans community, um, Latino community, uh, whatever. And that should be reflected. If it's like 13% of black people in this country, then 13 shows and 13 movies a year at least. Like there should be like, there should be a mandate at these networks and streaming services. You got to pick up at least 13 shows created by black people or, thir or pick up like if it's like, I don't know what the percentage of, of people living with disabilities. Like you have to pick up a certain number of shows created by people living with disabilities. Now, are all these shows going to be like Mad Men and Game of Thrones? Maybe not. But at the end of the day, who gives a shit? How many bad shows are there right now with white people on it on CBS? I can, I've lost count. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, let's have mandates and, and let's enforce them. And if they say, well, I don't like these. Oh, well, I don't like half the shit on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, we're, we're having this conversation in, in Pride Month and, you know, all, all three of us actually here on this have used our own personal histories as inspiration for the stories we've told, telling autobiographical or semi-autobiographical stories. Why do you think it's important to let queer people tell our own stories. Ryan, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think because we all know the psychic damage that we incurred by not seeing ourselves on mm -hmm. 
Like I would have saved, I would have saved so much time living at the I Hate Myself Fair if I had seen one person that like looked like me. But instead, I bought a ticket to that fair every single year until like the age of twenty nine or whatever. Mm. Like it, like you know, it's so so important to see your experiences reflected back at you. It really, really is. And um, I think also with queer creators, it's like. I always am talking to queer creators in terms of like instilling that confidence because I'm like, you know, your stories are needed. They're so unique. They're so interesting and they've never been told. Whereas like every show that gets sold, like when I look at the network log lines, I'm like, LOL, some person like moves into their wacky free spirited sister and they're type A and how will this work out? You know what I mean? It's like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like we, that, that is done. Like I'm over that. You know what I mean? Like like, we need fresh stories. We really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's important for us to tell these stories. And look, at the end of the day, I, you want to be careful because we don't want to restrict someone from telling a story just because it's not their own. Um, but I do think it's important that if you are telling a story about a, a life that is not yours, make sure someone who is whose life it is is sitting next to you and you're taking their guidance. Uh, but I think... The truth is, is like, like for the, the uh, episode of television that literally changed my life, and I'm grateful that it impacted so many others. It was a Thanksgiving episode. It, it was my coming out. That was it was very autobiographical. I mean, it thinly veiled is not even the word. I mean, it was so much of my experience, but and it was so specific to me that, mind you, I didn't even think it was going to make a peep because I, I just thought like, oh, well, this is interesting, you know. I but I think what I found is that I found even I was even closer to my own community. Because so many people were like, yeah, that's how it looked for me, too. It wasn't like my family throwing a Bible at me, but it was more like, what are the neighbors going to think? And and I thought, like, I was alone in that or that was weird. And so I found even more community and telling my own story and people saying I can relate to that or, or, you know, and but also too, and people who are not of the community. You don't know how many straight Jewish men hit me and go, that's my favorite episode of television. And I'm like, really interesting. And, and they'll say like, yeah, cause I feel like a, like an outcast in my family or I kind of feel like I didn't fit in or I didn't. And so I then had to also open up my eyes and go that our stories are just as relatable as straight stories. Like straight people like to watch our too. And can look at it and, and see themselves and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, oh, well, this is for the, this is just for Outfest. Like, let's get to Outfest stuff can be in the Sundance too, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think to me, it's important that we have a seat at the table and that we help to tell these stories. Cause what I, you have to give Ryan credit for it, as well as like, is like what, what the writer's room I think looks like on Pose and, you know, and how he was very inclusive on his, his latest show, Hollywood. Um, you know, I know Jeremy Pope had been, he, he got to have a voice on that show as well. It's just important that we get a voice too, because nobody can tell our stories like we can. Nobody can. And, and I'm telling you, whenever someone who doesn't care about the community tells it, it actually does damage. It actually undoes the work, undoes the work that we're actively trying to do because they're, they're doing things and putting things in narrative that aren't necessarily true. Mm. And you know, why I think it's important also that our stories get told by us in this moment is I think Hollywood has a history of profiting off our trauma without giving yeah, us sure. any jobs. And we live in a capitalism hellhole country where literally your worth is measured by your power in your bank account. Mm-hmm. And I think like I get so miffed when like people have like consultants, you know what I mean? Like like there's uh, right, 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 sure. there's been some job like shows that have been like about whatever and like like instead of like you yeah. scan the writer's room and you see that no one is actually there that has that experience, instead they're hired as a consultant. Fuck the consultants. Hire them as fucking writers. Give them that staff writer money, honey. Like they need to buy a new candle. Like that's like yeah. that's why that but that is how real and teach teach them. Teach them how to write. Teach exactly. them how to write. Exactly, exactly. Because it's like, I, I would wager to guess that like, I'm one of the only few disabled showrunners, like not many people are in this that's position. Power, but that's, that's what it needs to look like. It needs to look diverse at the top. And we need to, they need to give in the keys to tell their own story, not because people that haven't had that experience can't write about it. But because we're in a moment right now where, where there's no equal playing field. And that's also why I only hire um, gay actors to play gay parts not because I don't think straight people can play gay I think they can and they do a great job but because I know so many talented gay actors that truly would be much more huge if they weren't out and gay so while I can I'm going to give them all the jobs and all the money you know what I mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and I also speak to 
Um, I also, I'm very lucky. I'm so blessed that JoJo, who plays Hattie on uh, on 20s, happens to be queer. Um, a lot of the actors on there also happen to be queer because you kind of can't ask, but I'm like, oh, I can kind of see you are fantastic. Um, but um, but also, I want to speak to visibility and power in terms of it multiplying and other people that look like us. Isn't like my success and the reason why I go so hard is not self serving. Is because I know that we work in an industry of copycats. So because I'm doing well. They're gonna they're gonna start looking for other versions of me, and that's why to me it's important that you know. And I reached me and Ryan kind of touched based on social media, and we're DMing, and I think he asked like, "Hey, can you come be a part of this?" I was like, "Absolutely, whatever you need." It's important to me that Ryan be a huge success as well. And does it suck? And is that a lot of pressure on somebody? Sure, but it, look, that comes with being first through the gate because at the end of the day, like Ryan, this is bigger than you. Special is bigger than you. It needs to do well. It needs to succeed. It needs to, be, you know. You, I'm so happy that, that that math happened and you got the Emmy nomination. That is important. And I know people say, "Oh, awards can be superficial." Yeah, they are. But at the end of the day, it does increase your check. Your your, your you know, it increases your quote. It makes people take you seriously. And what will happen is, hopefully, Ryan, if there's maybe you're, if you feel up to it. Although I try to encourage people to do this. If there's a writer on your staff that also has a show or idea, if you can be like, "Yo, Netflix." This person over here is also dope. I want to EP their show. And so now you end up broadening your, your empire and you're helping another person get through the door. That's, that's to me, our responsibility. Anybody that's just successful and sitting there and counting their money, it's a, it's, it's a sin. It's irresponsible. Like, we have to, like, go hard and do super well so that way we can hold the door open for a whole new generation of storytellers that look like us. I totally agree. Like, I don't want to be the only disabled person on a diversity panel to the end of time. Like, I hate no. this. I like my show is one of the only shows about disability even though one in four people identify as disabled that's a huge part of the population and it's like i'm the only one i'm like honey like my back is breaking under this all this pressure like we need yeah. other people just so it's not just my experience in my world i don't i don't like that that does not bring me joy it gives me anxiety and it frustrates right. me <clears throat> yeah same uh, yeah and i i come across a lot of queer black people who are queer in private, but not queer in public, which again is their prerogative. You know, everybody's journey is theirs, but it just speaks to this thing that's like, and it doesn't, and, I, and I've gotten to a place where I thought if I could be successful enough, I could really make it, it'll convince a lot of these queer black people to come out of the closet. And it has not. And I have to realize that I cannot carry that weight. I cannot force other people to live how I live. Um, but I don't really don't know what more I could possibly do or how much more success. I'm like, guys, it ain't gonna hurt. But, you know, everybody, you know, has their own, their path to walk. Allies are important. Lena, before we wrap up, I, I mm -hmm. wanted to talk a little bit about um, Queen and Slim, which is a movie I've thought a lot about over the last several weeks, um, a, a film you you wrote that was released this past winter, directed by Melina Matsukas, who's yeah. such a visionary filmmaker. Um, wow. And I, that, that film reflected things that Black Americans have known for such a long time that white people in this country have resisted or refused to accept. How do you think that movie kind of intersects with the conversations that have come to the fore over the last several weeks? Uh, it, it, it was definitely almost disheartening to see it pop up in like top movies or on lists of things like that. Even though some people may think, oh, isn't that a good thing? It's like, I would never want a, a movie about black, police killing black people to continue to be relevant. My hope is that this film 20 years from now seems archaic. That is the goal. Unfortunately, the film was more prolific than I would have liked. But the truth is, when I was writing it at the time, there was like, like, like it always has been black people were being killed and their names were turned into hashtags. And I was seeing their faces on T-shirts and murals on walls and cities. And I just I was so frustrated and upset that it seemed like black people are more celebrated in death than we are in life. And that really was what I, I kind of had to write about. And unfortunately, we as Black people often die at the hands of police officers whose job it is to do what? Serve and to protect. And uh, we don't feel that way. And I think to live in a country in 2020 where our ancestors helped build this country for free, the least we could do is not have to be killed on the street uh, like animals. <clears throat> and so if people want to revisit the film and look at it, um, I, I I understand that, but I hope that they, my mission was, and, and having that ending look the way it did, was to make it, you feel how 
for me, black mothers have felt over the generations, uh, how black people feel, you know, even they aren't connected to some of these people that have been uh, gunned down, killed, strangled, uh, hung. I want people, I wanted to create characters that were so human and that you could smell them, that when they were killed by police, you felt grief. So that way, maybe a, a real black person that was not fictitious, that was not on celluloid, uh, wouldn't have to die. And there would be sympathy and there would be empathy for, for us as a community. Um, but look, D Spike Lee probably had that same wish when he made do the right thing and had a police officer kill Radio Raheem. Uh, but unfortunately, you fast forward down the line, and I've seen Spike Lee out, and he looks at me and he goes, mm -hmm. yeah, like we are still telling the same story, but we can't stop telling this story until the story is no longer relevant. And unfortunately, the story is still relevant. But I do believe we're living through a revolution. And my prayer is that this history will not repeat itself again. Mm. Lena Waithe, Ryan O'Connell, thank you so much for joining us here today for Time 100 Talks. We will hope to see you both soon.